So assign yourself a new title for the day, one that's going to bring the joy of the Lord out of thanksgiving to our great God. Our nation was founded by giving thanks to our great God. You need to make a list of the things that you should be thankful for. I say should be because we're really not. <laughs> well, I thank you for this, Lord, and I thank you for that. Now, that's not thankfulness. Thankfulness is out of a grateful heart, out of a recognition of what God is doing for us, out of a recognition that God owes us nothing, and out of a desire to thank him. Someone who loves us who are unlovable. He's very lovable. We're not very lovable. We're a porcupine at best, and he still strokes and caresses us. And quill by quill, he's divesting us of those things that are injurious to ourselves and to one another through the power of his spirit that we might cohabitate and fellowship with him. With that, how about we pray and wait off into the word? Great is your name, Lord. Great is your name. It is your name that has brought us out of darkness. It is your name that brings us into light. It is your name that you have rescued us. It is by your name that you hold back the forces of evil from carrying us off. And we praise your name. We thank you. We ask you to open your mighty word to us that we might receive from it and be transformed by it. Lord, I ask you to open our hearts. A spiritual man, that he might receive and grow stronger. I ask you, Lord, to help us open the treasure chest in our hearts so that we can store up your instructions and live by them. In Jesus' great name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're in our study in the book of Ephesians. We've been looking at the shield of faith. We're going to jump right into the scripture because we have a lot of scripture to cover in this session, and there's a reason for that. Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, what's the armor for? We have been finding out. It's to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, if you're not aware of the schemes of the devil, you can't stand firm against them. If you're unwilling to acknowledge that he has some plans in this life, if you're unwilling to really see that he's plotting and that he is your enemy and he's God's enemy, then you'll never get the fight right. You'll never be equipped in the fight. Our fights and our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers and against the world forces of the, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand, stand firm. In addition to all this, in other words, above all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. God's shield, his mighty shield, it's like a sphere that surrounds us and can protect us. In our next study, we're going to be looking at how Mathematically, that sphere comes together and the different components. The actual math behind it of how our God can place us in a position of protection. But in this session, we must look at the things that would disable us from being able to stand inside the sphere that would disable us from receiving a shield of protection. We play a role in this, I can tell you. If you make the decision to walk in a minefield, the sphere will not protect you because you made the decision to walk in the wrong place. 
if you make the decisions for your life and say God said, then the evidence will be surrounding you by the sadness and the things that don't work out and the cost because the cost will get greater and greater and greater. I think something we need to look at that we have digressed through partly we went through the hall of faith but something that people don't realize is Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 are one synonymous non-stop statement from the Holy Spirit about faith. Most people think chapter 12 is about sin. It's not. It's about things of faith and how faith can be disabled by sin. So sin plays a small role in it. But the whole chapter 11 and chapter 12 is just about faith and how to maintain faith. Giving us a directive of what faith looks like. Giving us a directing and understanding of those who participate in it so that we can participate in it in the same manner. In chapter 11, we saw the 15 principles of faith. And those are listed at the end of your notes. Don't turn to those. But we must do this. We must read completely, nonstop, chapter 11 and chapter 12 in order to see how it ties together and what it ties to. Not looking at sin, but looking at God wants us to be able to live and walk in faith. He wants us to be able to hear his voice and do what he says and be about his business. Trust him, believe him, be faithful to him, be valiant in his life. And so these two chapters together, if we just look at them like we pull out from the satellite view and we're looking down to earth to see what is he talking about? It gives us a description of how to maintain that faith. It gives us a description of what will offset that faith. It gives us a description of how our participation in certain things will cause that faith to be null in effect. Because remember, faith is not just us being Yoda and, and, and holding out our hand and waving it to make something happen. That, 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 now, the prayer of faith, that's a small little thing of faith. Because faith is a composite thing that we've identified several of those composite issues that faith is made up of. Our faithfulness is a part of that. Our obedience is a part of faith. Our trust in God is a part of faith. Our believing in the word is a part of faith. Our believing in what the patriarchs and the prophets had said. Our, our believing that what the apostles have said. Our believing of what our Lord Jesus can say through the Holy Spirit. All these are just different branches and aspect of one thing called faith that we misidentify so readily. Now, faith is like an egg that has a complete shell around it. Now, you can put an X on any part of that shell and say, now there's the faith I believe in, that little bitty X. But I'm telling you, the whole sphere has to be compiled together and knit together in order for it to be operational. If it's not operational, we're constantly taking hits from the enemy. The enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy. So establishment of our faithfulness to God is what goes in the sphere. There's something in that eggshell <laughs> that the sphere will protect. We'll get into that into our next session. But right now, wrap your mind around faith and listen to what the Lord has to say in this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts through faith, through his dead, he, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world 
And he became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to the place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in the land and a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, following heir, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself self received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that time, as many descendants as the stars in heaven in number, and the innumerable as the sands which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed them, though they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own or an inhabitants of their own that is with God. And indeed, if they have been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return to it. But as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it is said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of his sons, Joseph and worship, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's addict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure all ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ a greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as they were passing through the dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish among or along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me if I go and tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms and performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises and shut the mouths of lions and quenched the powers of the fire, escaped the edge of the swords from weakness, were made and from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured and not accepted their release so that they might obtain a better res resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, and yes, also chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, and they were sawn in two, and they were tempted, and they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, men of whom the world is not worthy or was not worthy wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the grounds, and all of these having gained approval through their faith. Approval of who? God. And did not receive what was promised. But God had provided something better for us, 
so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Therefore, since now we're starting chapter 12. Now, what's our whole theme about faith? Is it not? So as we get into this, think about your faith, how it can be exercised. And now he begins to deal with the issues concerning our faith since he's established. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how to have faith. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. Now, I know I've heard many sermons around sins that entangle us. But what does it entangle us from? It entangles us from believing God, trusting God. It entangles us from standing in His presence. It entangles us from being obedient to God. It entangles us to be rebellious toward God. It entangles us to have our will instead of His will. And if that takes place, then our faith now is made null in effect. So men become men of religion rather than faith. We're supposed to live by faith, and that's hearing God's voice. And I tell you, if you're disobedient, you will not hear God's voice. So it says, lay, a, lay aside every encumbrance. And you know what those encumbrances are. are. Matter of fact, we plan the easy way. We plan the way we want it rather than the way God wants it. We plan around it so that we're comfortable. We should be planning to be in God's presence every moment of the day. We should be planning to to come and stand before Him. We should be planning to stand and be bathed in worship in the truth of God. But our plans are often about other things and we barely have time to make it to service or we barely have time to pray we don't take the time to pray we don't we don't force ourselves into that that time of not only prayer but obedience the way god wants it it's easy for people to okay i'm i'm relaxed now now i'll pray well god may have called you to pray in the midst of the storm in the midst of the fire in the midst of what was going on He may have called you to give up your exercises of what you wanted to do and do it his way. Matter of fact, he requires obedience, not sacrifice. And most of us don't want to do the obedience. Instead, we'll sacrifice something later on. Enough for the comments. Let's get back into the text. After he gets through making the statement, he says, Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us your race is a race for faith because if you have faith you'll be able to stand in god's presence your race is a race to live a life of faith because if you have faith now you'll have directives from god of what to do in this life now he comes in and he now begins to focus on our faith He said, fix your eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of faith. Jesus himself is the author of our faith. Man does not have it within himself to have faith. It is a divine origin faith is. And so if your eyes are fixed on the boob tube, if your eyes are fixed on pleasures, if your eyes are fixed on company, if your eyes are fixed on chitter-chatter, if your eyes are fixed on anything but God, your eyes are not fixed on Jesus and your faith will not grow because he is the author of your faith and he's commanding you, keep your eyes upon him, elsewise you're not in the race. Now, for every race, there's a course that's laid out. That's where they put little flags up and they say, here's where you run. And I can tell you, when I go out and look at mankind, the places that call themselves by his name but don't know him. They're not keeping their eyes upon him. They don't know him. They're not running between the flags of faith. They're not in faithfulness to him. They're in duty to themselves, calling it religion, saying that we're following God. Do not just give him lip service. He set out definite flags. And he says, you run between these. Now, how do I know how to run between those? Whatsoever things please him is of faith. My attitudes are supposed to be one of joy and thanksgiving to my Lord. 
If it is, then I'm between the flags. If my attitude is Mr. or Mrs. Grump, and I hate life, and I don't like it, and I want to escape, and I want things my way, I'm not between the flags. I'm not running in faith. I'm in disobedience, and I'm a rebel. Um, I don't know if you've got the little, well, you don't have the little critters we had in Texas. We had a special little critter down there called an armadillo. And it looks like a big roly-poly with an armor shell on the outside with some sort of dog's head with dog's teeth. And, uh, I mean, it's a wicked-looking little creature. It digs holes in the grounds and digs things up, and it's, it's blind and it's deaf. <laughs> you can just walk right up on one of these little creatures, and, but they're tough as a boot, and, and they burrow in the ground, and they tear everything up, and they're quite destructive. But they're also a natural carrier of leprosy. One of the few creatures on earth that's a natural carrier of leprosy. I find that interesting that there is such a creature that's hard-shelled. There is such a creature that just wants to live in darkness. There's such a creature that just it could care less what you want. It could care less that you're standing there. And it tears up the ground. It looks like a big rat. They don't smell very good. They got a rat's tail. And I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up because our mindset and our heart is supposed to be in the race with Jesus and our eyes are supposed to be fixed with him. If we get outside that, now we are burrowing. We're wanting what we want and we're burrowing in life and we're changing into something we should not. We also are carriers of leprosy. Leprosy was a deadly disease that caused the nose to rot right off your face and your fingers to rot off your hands, your toes to rot off your feet, literally, literally rot until there's nothing left but a stub down here, including the bone. It was a hideous, hideous disease that mankind once had no ability to be able to control. If you caught leprosy, you were a dead person walking. And the problem is... It broke all relationships with anyone you love because if you loved somebody and you hugged them and you had leprosy, you just spread it to them. And my whole point in giving you this synopsis is because if we're not running between the red flags that Jesus puts up, if our eyes are not fixed upon him, we can't run the race and we can't stay between the flags and we have no faith because the sole person that faith comes from is from him. But if our eyes are stayed upon him, now we stay between the flags and we're not a carrier of leprosy. We're not going to spread it to our loved ones. I've seen people tell somebody, I love you, but they're beating on them. In the flesh or in words? In the flesh or in circumstances? Oh, I love you, but, I love you, but. I love you so much, I'm going to get you straightened out. <laughs> That's not love. God's definition of love is for you to be a person of peace, be kind and be gentle, be giving, filled with the joy of our Lord, realizing that he's not a hard taskmaster over you. Why should you be a hard taskmaster over somebody else? And that's not just a husband towards a wife. I've seen wives just as brutal to husbands. I'm telling you, every one of us can have this disease of brutalness. But if we want to run the race, our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus. And if you've got a frown on your face, your eyes can't be fixed on Jesus. If you want to argue in this life, your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on what you want. So we have to make up our mind in this race how we're going to run it if we want faith. If you want faith that can move mountains. If you want faith that can change the course of your life, if you want faith that will enable you to see God, if you want faith to enable you to do the miraculous, walk in the miraculous, live in the miraculous, if you want faith that the kingdom of God becomes so real that you don't care about anything here on earth, why? Because of real encounters in a real place. So he begins to deal with these things by stating, first of all, the whole race is can be only run with our eyes locked on Jesus himself. If you want faith, it comes with your eyes locked on Jesus. I remember the inception of the Jesus movement. <laughs> A whole bunch of hippies all across the nation. Young people everywhere fell head over heels in love with Jesus. And as a result of keeping their eyes upon him, they came out of darkness. And those same young men that were long-haired and 
bad breath and didn't know how to bathe and all that stuff were transformed into young men within two to three years. They wouldn't dare come in the Lord's presence except in a dress the best they could be. It changed their ideas and their minds about their lifestyle, their purposes and their actions. So let's go on and catch the rest of the breath in this. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the Arthur and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I find that an interesting thing. The Lord had joy set before him for enduring the cross. Jesus is exemplifying to us, you ought to have joy in your heart for running the race with me in this life. He's running us alongside of us. He looks over at the cross and he's, man, I got a real joy out of taking that thing on. It was a bear and I nailed myself to it and I took it down. No, you wouldn't have to hang. Now, come on, get your joy and let's run together. But you can't have joy if you're in disobedience. You can't have joy if you're in rebellion. Anytime that we get into rebellion or disobedience, our joy instantly vaporizes and we make everybody else's joy vaporize too. He despised, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Comment about that is if Jesus, if we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, and he shows us his joy and gives us his joy so that we can endure things in life, if he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, that activates the other passages of Scripture, if you love me, obey me. And it activates the, 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 that he'll reveal himself to us and in us and through us. And it activates the passage of scripture. In the book of Revelations, it says, uh, if you overcome these things, I'll give you the right to sit with me in my throne just as I sit with my father in his throne. And that's not a future tense. That's a spiritual sense of you seeing him now and him saying, come sit beside me. Why? Because if your eyes fixed upon him within the expanse of those red flags, there's an occasional sitting time with him. Of him, come sit down right here. Come and sit with me. And we need those special times because now we get to see the Father march out the orders of life. We get to see the Son and the love between the Father. We get to see his great forgiveness and we get to see his great joy and that there's a real kingdom and we're no longer lost in our apathetic little worlds and our pathetic ways and our pathetic past that we want to focus on and say, oh, poor me and how the bad life I've had. Jesus said, what are you still having one for? I died for it. Start having a good life. Get into his joy. Make it a point. Become his soldier. Ramrod yourself. No, you're going to walk in joy. Make yourself get between those flags because if you do not, you'll be out there in darkness where depression is and it'll drag you further and further off course. The enemy will come in and, well, I, I guess you're just not doing too well. I guess you're just something wrong with you. I guess, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're just not going to make it. I guess Jesus is just not going to be strong enough. He's strong enough if we'll just get in a race. He's strong enough if we'll just keep our eyes upon him. He does not force himself upon us. He does not come in and try to change our will. He says, it's my will that you stay right between these flags. And if you stay between these flags and your eyes are locked on my eyes, all that stuff of the past is going to go away. Why? Because it was on me. Why do you talk about something that was put on him like you bore it? Why do you talk about some misery of the past that he paid the price for when he bore it? He's saying, wait a minute. I'm the one that should be talking about that. I'm the one that died for that. I'm the one that went to hell for you. I'm the one that did these things for you. Why are you talking about it? That's stealing a little bit of his thunder, is it not? That's why he hates pity parties. <laughs> he says, come on, come on, snap out of it. Put your eyes on me. I'm going to take you to the Father's throne room, and you and I are going to sit with him, and you're going to see there's a real kingdom. There's a real substance of the Father going on. Everything that you know will pass away, and you need to become aware of his presence now. Now, shall we get on into some more meanings here? He says, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you don't grow weary and lose heart. You've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood and striving against your sin. I tell you what, we shed a lot of blood to sin. 
We really put ourselves in some bad situations that really cost us and bleed us to death in our future, in sorrows and pain and in our finances and in our, in our relationships. We, we're bleeding them to death. We're willing to do that, but we're not willing to bleed a little bit and say, no, I won't treat you like dirt. No, I won't act like a son of Satan. No, I won't cheat. No, I won't lie. No, I won't fight. I won't argue. I won't resist. We've not put the fight where it needs to be. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, Jesus will empower you to fight off those urges and put the fight where it belongs. And he says, and you've forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons. I don't know. I hope and pray that you've had some experience with your Lord Jesus. I know many of you have. Where he embraced you, and he said, oh, my son. That includes you ladies, too. Your son daughters. <laughs> and he says, oh, my son. When you felt him, you got lost in him. You no longer were lost in this world. There was a new world that opened up. You remember the exhilaration and the freshness and the newness and how he washed away everything bad of you and bad in life. How he embraced you and his love and, and, and his joy and his peace as he, as he intertwined himself in your heart. He says, you've forgotten these things. You're supposed to remember these things. It's, it was an exhortation. It was an exhortation from him. Exhortation of the living God. The same living God that stood and spoke to Moses and Abraham. The same living God that can, if your faith raises to a level of obedience, your faith can give you face-to-face -face experience with your God here and now. Now when you see him, it changes the whole scenario of life. Instead of us worried about our little dramas, now, because we can see him, we become interested in something different. We become interested. He steals our interest because it's, he's so grand. And his world is so grand. He came to establish his kingdom here in my life. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor faint when you're reproved by him. I meet some people that, oh, I just can't stand it when God tells me I do something wrong. <laughs> why would you rather keep doing it wrong? Or would you, why not just stop doing it? <laughs> don't faint when he says don't do that. Just say yes, Lord. We have a little dog named Jack, and he does a lot of things right. He's an absolute joy sometimes. When we go on walks, the last walk I took him on, we were over in the soccer park, and the little guy just did it right. We walk, he walked probably about six miles, and I walk about a mile. <laughs> Actually, he runs six miles. <laughs> I didn't have to tell him to come once. I've established a certain pattern that we walk. And he, I've established the boundaries of that pattern for him by telling him times past, no, come. You've gone too far. When I first started out, he'd be a half mile out there. And I'd, Jack! <laughs> so I, I helped him along. I, I took a bag of treats. <laughs> and God helps us along. He's a bag of treats. So that when he says, come, we don't see it as punishment. But if you don't have the treat to begin with and they understand it's for their benefit, then they take it as punishment. And he's just, I was just trying to stop him from running on the highway. I was trying to stop him from getting lost because uh, he's of the mindset of just, oh, there's a butterfly. And when the next county, when he realizes, wait, where'd everybody go? <laughs> We're that way too. And when and God tells us to come, we kind of treat that as a rebuke. Like, oh, I got to come. Jack doesn't. He looks at it. What do you got, master? What do you got? 
Matter of fact, he'll run out on purpose and he'll look back. Okay, you're going to tell me to come? You're going to tell me to come? You're going to tell me to come? He wants to treat. Your Lord will train you the same way. He's not out just to punch you in the nose and say no. Anytime he said no to me, it was for my benefit. A train was fixing to run over me. And I get mad to him. What do you mean I can't stand on the railroad track? <laughs> what do you mean there's a train? I don't see it. <laughs> he says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges. Scourges means that he takes the time to make sure that we understand that's going to hurt you. I've got to get your attention. If it takes a switch on the leg to keep you from dying of a train wreck, is it not worth a switch on the leg? But there's the problem. We can't see the train wreck. He can. And he says, I, I, I love you so much that, I um, mean, I, I remember Jack being out close to the road and a squirrel run across it and there's cars coming the other day. It's racing down the road and a squirrel runs across the road and Jack's after it. And Jack's... Jackie is hollering at the top of her lungs. No! You think she was wanting to just beat on the dog? Oh, was she panic-stricken because the dog was placing himself in a position because of a squirrel that the little dog could die? She genuinely loves the dog. I do, too. I would have hollered twice as loud had I been out there. But my hollering was to, for one effect, and that was to gain his attention to keep him from going across the street and getting run over it is for discipline that you, do, you endure. We need discipline. If you don't want discipline, you're not his son. He calls you a bastard. He calls you illegitimate. He says, you got another father. I'm not your father if you don't want my discipline. But if you want his discipline, then you're supposed to endure his discipline. And I'm telling you, he doesn't discipline rebels. Rebel can even hear the word no. And they're already in resistance. They don't take any scourging. They don't take any dressing down. They don't. They, they won't even take a no. They just instead, I'm going to fight because you said no. It is for discipline that you endure. Now, keep in mind, what is all this discipline about? It's so that we can have faith enough to stand in God's presence and hear him and see him. Do you want that faith to be able to see him and hear him? Then it, is it not worth having a little discipline from him. And I can tell you, when I disciplined my kids, I didn't get any pleasure out of it. I don't get any pleasure out of discipline, Jack. I don't get any pleasure out of discipline people in the body of Christ. It's a burden. It, 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 it's, it, it, it's something I have to endure that, that oh, I, I've got to bring correction to this person. I, oh, Lord, I don't want to do that. I do not like to do it. Now, I, I'm sure you didn't either, unless you were a control freak. Parents who are control freak wanted to control everything in their in their child's life and had to be, oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you can't do that. They weren't in it for the interest of bringing the child up in the admiration of God. They were in it because of control. God's not that way with us. He said, if you want to control, it's your free will. Go ahead. But if you want to learn how to hear my voice and move into the kingdom of God and have experience of seeing me face to face. It's going to take a little switch on your legs. Now, do you want that or not? See, we have to realize there's an exchange for receiving it. We have to desire discipline from our God and saying, yes, my Lord, whatever's necessary, get my attention, put something, put some marks on me that I can remember. Give me some pain that I won't forget so I won't get close to that street again and I'll stay between the flags of faith and keep my eyes on Jesus. When we are touched by the Lord, all of a sudden we're set on fire. We want to hear His Word. We listen to many, many messages. When we get to the edge of the flags, now we don't want to hear messages. Or we spend more time doing other things. When you get to the edge of the flags, you don't pray, you don't read the Bible, and you don't listen to messages. Dangerous area to be in. You need to rekindle that first love that was within you. Turn on the messages. Start listening to a message or two a day. Start reading the Word and praying. 
Uh, you know, my Lord does not let me get away with not praying. I, I have quite a few duties as a pastor. Some of those duties take many, many hours of the day. And in the middle of the night, he comes. Almost every night, at least twice a night, said, get up, pray. He don't give me no slack. I don't give him no lip. I said, oh, you're here, Lord. Oh, let's talk. Let's pray. I got to spend six hours with him last night. Two hours, three sessions of two hours each. And the delight of my soul of being in his presence is just amazing. It's amazing what he puts in my heart to pray. It's amazing what he does in prayer. Now, occasionally I get some downtime where I don't have some of the common duties of life as a pastor, and I get to pray during the day. But my point is, is he, he intentionally helps keep me between those little guardrails. I, I thirst and hunger after him because of his visitations that he comes and brings. And he brings those because I desire to see his face. I desire, I start calling out upon him. When I get ready to go to bed, I'm calling, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to talk to you until I see your face before I go to bed. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to listen to you until you speak. <laughs> I, I really, everything that's within me, call out to him. And the first thing in the morning, I spend maybe an hour in prayer before I get up most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, but most of the time it does. If it doesn't work out that way, I promise you it's in the middle of the night and the Lord will wake me completely up. He said, I don't want you halfway asleep. Since you didn't have time to pray today, we got two hours right now, <laughs> and you're not going to be able to sleep a wink. <laughs> I said, yes, my Lord, and I look forward to those times. We must endure. That's what you call enduring. Not only allowing the Lord to wake you up, but being joyous. Yes, my Lord, what would you speak? That's part of the discipline I must endure. God deals with you as sons. Well, what son is there of whom the father does not discipline? If you're without discipline, of which you have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children, not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of the spirit and live? For they discipline us for a short time and it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. What is he trying to get us into? Into his holiness. Remember the passage of scripture that says, who can ascend the holy hill? That's a real, that's a real passage of scripture about a real place. Moses ascended that holy hill and stood in God's presence. He said, who can ascend it? Persons with clean hands and a pure heart. So his discipline is to help us become holy so that we can have encounters with him and those encounters with him now help build our faith. Remember, faith comes by hearing. You have an encounter with your God. You've, you, you, you've not only heard him, but you've seen him. It increases your faith inside and increases your understanding. I'm going to stay between the red flags because I'll get to see his face there. Now it's not a point of, oh, the red flag thing again. No, it's a, that's where his face is at. I'm reminded of the person that uh, walked up to the Yukon and decided he was going to do a little gold mining. But he was a little on the lazy side. He got there and, well, uh, I think I'll do this on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, I don't get much else out of it, you know, if I do it on Monday, Sunday, Saturday, and Wednesdays and I've never panned out much, and I, I, I've been single pan on those days. He goes out and stands and watches the other people pan or stands at a distance. Gold nuggets all over the ground and too blind to pick them up and too lazy to pan. We're supposed to come to God with an eager heart, realizing that there is solid gold that we can extract when he calls us. I don't know if you know anything about the Yukon or not. That time for mining gold is very short because everything freezes over. 
Very short. I lived in Alaska for a while. Understand that. Gold mining is very short up there. I can tell you that life, it's a lot colder than Alaska ever thought about being. And whenever God calls and he sets a time that the river's open for panning gold, should not we run there and get between the red flags and hope to see Jesus and tear out a bucket full of gold? But if we fold our arms and say, well, uh, that usually didn't work for me. Uh, we were just lazy, downright lazy. We were resistant to his instruction, and we actually were like Esau. Didn't care that the things of God would be made manifest. We didn't count them as something that were absolute treasure. And I'm telling you, God did not like Esau. Matter of fact, not only did he not like him, he said, I hate him. I hate him. Now be careful in your so-called walk of faith that if God is going to come and open his treasure chest, he did to Esau. And Esau, ha, ah, I don't care about that stuff right now. Just give me some beans. He despised the treasure chest that was open. It made God wrathful towards him because he did not care about the things of God when God brought those things. So, jumping back into the passage of Scripture, furthermore, we talked about the earthly fathers. All discipline, verse 11, for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. <coughs> Especially if we're a little rebel. <laughs> you just hate me. You just want to point out. You just... And then we can, you know, have you ever had your child compare you with them? Now, who are you to think you can do this to me? <laughs> well, I'm bigger than you, number one. Number two, discussion's over. <laughs> it was not a good thing for you to challenge your parent. It's not a good thing for children to challenge their, their parents. It's not a good thing for us to challenge God's authorities. Matter of fact, which brings in just kind of a note. We did a session on Barak not too long ago. A man of valor that was counted as a man of faith. Do you realize this guy didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead him? Do you realize he was not steeped in Scripture? Do you realize he was not necessarily one of God's chosen agents that God spoke to directly to do something? That's what kind of sets him aside from some of the other guys. The other guys were hearing directly from God. He heard from one of God's agents and so respected God and his agent that he was willing to do what God said through an agent. That's a, it's, it's an amazing example of faith being counted to somebody as a result of not hearing themselves. It was Deborah that heard from God, was it not? And he said, oh, God's saying that? You want me to raise up 10,000 man army, huh? Do you realize how much faith it took for him to believe that was from God and do that? Facing maybe an army of 100,000? And it said that there wasn't even one sword found amongst 40,000 Israelites or one spear. I think his faith... No wonder God put his name on that hall of faith because he didn't receive a divine word other than through an agent. It wasn't personally to him. He didn't receive divine instructions about what to do other than through an agent. And he believed God because she said, this is what God says. You get over here and you listen to this. God says, you gather the men of this tribe and this tribe only and you go down and face them and God will give you the day. And he says, if you go with me, Which, if an agent of God gives you some instruction, he better be going with you. But I can tell you, we can be men and women of faith. I've been a man of faith for many years because whenever I had a major decision come up, I'd call John Castillo. Hey, John, I, I've got this. I'm facing this. And would you pray? And would you intercede? And ask God. And I, I need confirmation on this. 
They used to have another man named J.R. White, another guy named Dolan Brunson. I could go on and give you about four other brothers that I've walked with through the years. And I call them brothers now, but they're actually fathers. And they've never lost their spiritual leadership in my life. My point is in giving you this. I sought them out for their instruction. And sometimes since I was seeking their instruction, they would tell me the truth. How can I move closer to God? Well, stop chewing tobacco, son. What? <laughs> How can I move closer to God? Well, stop smoking. Well, what's that guy to do with moving closer to God? I didn't, sass. I said, you mean I can move closer to God if I don't do those things? Well, that's a small part of it, but it plays a key in it. I didn't argue. I didn't know what small part. I just knew they could walk with God and I couldn't. I knew they could hear God and I couldn't. And so I said, I'll do that. And piece by piece, I began to cut away those things that would disable me from having holy hands and a pure heart. Or holy heart and pure hands. <laughs> All discipline for the moment seems not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it. See, I got some real visitations of God. And i tell you why. It's because I trained myself to endure his discipline. Afterwards, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Where does righteousness come from? From Jesus. He's the only one that can give us righteousness. It's right between those fence posts when, he put it, when I put my eyes upon him and now he's got his eyes upon me. And he says, ah, oh, you're between the fence post. Let's meet. Let's talk. Let's run. Let's, let's play. Let's, let's sit beside the Father. Righteousness is being imputed to me. Then he gives us Nine different instructions immediately after this about our faith. He said, you want faith? Then strengthen your hands that are weak. Now, the hands are what reaches for the things in life. And how are they supposed to be strengthened? Hanging on to Jesus, not the things of life. He says, strengthen the knees that are feeble. Knees are only feeble if they're walking off of God's property out between the flags. They're strengthened when he grabs us by his hand, by our hand, and we got hold of his hand. There's strength, there's supernatural spiritual strength that enters us that our knees and feet are no longer feeble. We get our spiritual stand. Now, I ask you, when you've had your encounters with Jesus, and it was a real high point, were you teetering about faith? Were you teetering about believing in God? Were you teetering about sadness? Were you teetering about the circumstances of life? No, you became solid and stable. Everything that was feeble left, and now there's strength. But then he gives us these instructions about faith. He says, I want you to make straight paths for your feet. How do you make straight paths for your feet? Well, one, get up in the morning and say, what do I do that violates God's principles and the red flags? You don't know what you do? If you planned out selfishness in your way that day, then you've made a plan that causes fights and quarrels and arguments. If you've made out a plan that what you're going to achieve, instead of one being in submission, now your plan is to have all kinds of stumbling blocks. See, stumbling blocks are things we want there. Things that cause others to give us our way and what we want, that we extract from life. And he's saying, he says... Uh, I want you to make straight paths for your feet. Get these things out of the way. Now, are you willing to do that? The things that you want and you desire, are you willing to get them out of the way? Because he makes the statement. If you want faith, if you want to be between those flags, clean up the path for your feet. So that the limb which is lame. Now, he gives recognition <coughs> that we have some lame limbs. He understands that we can't walk. One reason we can't walk is because of the stumbling blocks that are there. He says, go clean those out instead of protecting them. He says, if we do so, then our weak limb will not be turned out of joint. Now, I don't, I stepped out of my car one time in a hurry, and there was a gutter next to me that went 
this away. And when I did, stepped on my ankle, my ankle turned completely upside down. I was looking at the bottom of my foot. And it was out of joint. And that was not a good thing. That's not a mild sprain. When you're looking at the bottom of your foot and you hear a loud pop, you're out of joint. And it's a serious thing, and it causes a lot of pain. And not only that, it takes a long time to recover. It was nearly two years before that limb recovered. Now, if you've got a little sprained ankle, get the blocks out of the way. That's not being out of joint, because if you don't get the blocks out of the way and the stumbling blocks out of the way in your relationship with Jesus, your functionality with him, that means we don't lie, we don't chew, we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't go to bars, we don't fuss, we don't fight, we don't argue. We make a determination within our heart, I cannot have holy hands if I'm going to engage in battle with you. Those stumbling blocks are serious. I want to see my God more than I want to win a fight and an argument with somebody. I want to see him face to face more than I want my way and my will. I want to see him face to face more than I want things. I want to be led into the paths of righteousness and truth and see his shining glory. I want to see his hand outstretched and heal. I want to have experiences with him putting gas in my gas tank. I want to have experiences with him when I cut my leg in half with a chainsaw. I want to see him heal. I couldn't take place if I was in arguments and fusses and fights and, and the bitternesses of life. I would not have seen those things. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't do it. It's not worth it. Count the cost. He says, pursue peace with all men. If you want faith... Faith to hear and see. You must make it your purpose to pursue peace with all men. And if you're going to be at peace, those who you're supposed to be in submission to, you should be on top of that submission thing. And make it your aim to find out what they want, when they want it, and fulfill it before they ever asked for it. They shouldn't have to ask for it time after time after time. That's not submission. Submission means you learn your place in divine order on this world. It would be like if I had to hire you and I come in and train you. Okay, this is what I want you to do today. And then I have to come back tomorrow. Well, I, I, you, you forgot to do this. Oh, I was going to do that. <laughs> if you are making the statement, you were going to do that. You should have had it done before I showed up. If you were an employee at my company. Because I showed you I wanted that done. If you knew that I wanted that done, it should have been first on your list. And everything else on your list should have been last. But we, in our list before God, always put our stuff first and his stuff last. He's saying, if I gave you a command, you fulfill it first. Then if you've got time to go fulfill your stuff, do it. Pursue peace with all men. We're supposed to pursue sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Our desire is to want to see God. Sanctification can be obtained, but you have to pursue it. Most of us know how to drive down to the mall and pursue something we want. I'm telling you, it's much more obvious of how to pursue sanctification. What's the opposite of sanctification? Sanctification. Defilement? If I call you a low-down, lizard-loving person, I have defiled myself. And I have lost what sanctification could have been obtained. If I grip my teeth at you and bite nails, oh, you tore me up. Oh, man. I'm fine. I'm fine. I am defiled before my Lord. Because he watches to see my responses to see if they're spiritual or to see if they're fleshly. It's because somebody's not behind the door watching you and they didn't see you. Your God does. And what he's looking at is, do you want to be a man or woman of faith or not? Do you really want to be in my presence and see the miraculous and see the holy city and see the things that are there and participate in those or not? Because he's standing and watching Every situation and circumstance that takes place, he's watching to see the reaction. What if the situation and circumstances was just made to see what our reaction would be? 
What if all this is just a, 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 a myriad of, of, of things that don't exist and it's just to see how we will play out to whether we will be faithful to a living God or not? What if you don't exist and you're just a figment of my imagination and it's just a test to see whether I will live honorably before my God or not? I'm telling you, it will be almost that simple when we stand before him. Because everything that's made in this age was made to pass away and to give us tests so that we would know as to whether we were for our God or for ourselves. So if you're failing the test, you're failing it before God and before yourself because you're not keeping your eyes on Jesus and seeing what the true goal is. The goal is a life of faith in God's presence. Do you realize that you have the same faith within you already deposited that Jesus had? You have the same faith already on deposit within you that Elijah had? That could call down fire out of heaven? And if you can learn to be a woman and man of faith, then the supply that's already planted within you can be accessed. And if we're not going to be women of men of faith... We will not access the supply and the deposit that's been made within us. Some of you have been called to be Deborah's, but failing miserable in being who you are because of what you want. We must give up who we are and what we want and take on our master's mindset, our Lord Jesus' mindset, and become like him. He's the only one that could please the Father. So our pattern of our eyes must be fixed upon him because he is capable of pleasing the Father. And if I stay between the red flags, I'm pleasing the Father. All right, got some more ground to cover here. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. How do we come short of the grace of God? By knowing what is written by knowing what we are supposed to do and not do it. To know to do what is right and not do it, the scripture says, is sin. Point blank sin. See to it that no one comes short of this. Make sure that you're not the one that comes short. You know what your God requires. You know what he's calling you to. He's saying, you make sure you're not short. Now, it implies that if we are not obedient in these areas, there might be a shortage of grace. Does it? Is that what it says? If we read it backwards? He saying, make sure you don't fall short of the grace of God. I need his grace. I need him to resign. I need him to come and lead my life. And he says, see to it that no one I'm short of the great, and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble. Boy, I tell you, if you got bitterness in this life, it springs forth like a bubbling cesspool and it brings trouble. We've got to deal with our bitternesses. We've got to say, I got no right to any bitterness. Jesus bore all these. If I'm bitter, it's a cesspool of trouble for me and everything around me. I must be serious about this particular matter. Unless you like trouble, unless you like a cesspool, unless you want everyone around you defiled too. And then you're going to wonder, why are they acting this way? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing this? What's wrong with those people? If you have bitterness... It causes trouble. It springs up. And it brings a stench with it. And it sets everything off around you. And will defile many. Word for word what the scripture says. God hates bitterness. He provided. When the children of Israel came to bitterness. He provided a special substance that went in the water to make it sweet. That substance was a piece of wood that was a special piece of wood. Connotations in Scripture that it was a cross of Christ that was put into the water. 
to make it sweet. You realizing Jesus not just died for you. But he expects you to live for him. Not in bitternesses of life. Not hating situations and circumstances. You need to drink of him. You need to put him in the waters that are bitter in your life. And see him in it so that he can purify it. And if you see him in it and he's purifying it and he's standing in it, then you can drink it and not even die of the bitterness. Not even be filled with it. Matter of fact, I, I bet you that was the sweetest water they had when they were in the desert. Which God says about our lives that he can sweeten them. Jesus came to sweeten our lives. He came to sweeten the days of our lives here on earth. And he's the only source of sweetness. You've lived life without him and think how miserable you were. He's the only source of sweetness and we must seek after him. We must ask him constantly, oh Lord Jesus, come and, 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 and I, I want your cross to be in everything. I want your, your, your blood to touch everything. You're, you're in the midst of things. Don't forget about him. Make him in the midst of all your bitternesses. And you see him in his suffering. You see him in what he did. Now your eyes are off of the flesh, off of me, myself, and I, and oh poor me. They're supposed to be fixed upon him. He did something marvelous for you and for me. That root of bitterness. If you've got troubles. It's because a spring is there that should not be. And it can change because he says, he says, you make sure of this. Make sure that no root of bitterness springs up. You can make sure first in your heart. I'm not going to be a bitter pool anymore. Every time you find bitterness coming off your tongue or acid about somebody or comments about something, go to Jesus. Oh, Lord, I need you to I'm, come stand right in this. Come and, and bring your cross. And, and Jesus, you sanctify. You make this pool. I'll make it where I'll, I can drink it with joy. The circumstances that are set before me are nothing compared to the circumstances you went through. And of course... That there be no more immoral or godless person like Esau. I find that interesting. God counted him immoral and godless. Who sold his own birthright for a single meal. That's where we count his spiritual access to the personhood of God. We realize Esau, through the promises of his forefathers, had the right to have face-to-face -face meetings with God. Had the right to stand at the riverbank with gold nuggets at his feet and saying, eh, I could care less about those gold nuggets. Maybe on Tuesday I'll come and get some. Be careful how you approach God and when. If you're approaching it as Esau, then you're counting the things of God as no value and he watches. And I promise you, it will cost you big time. Make sure that you're not like him. Not a self-reliant man or self-pleasured or self-centered. Don't be like the rich man, self-made. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. If you affront God on this level, if you look at the holy things of God and think that you can approach when you want and not when you want. Or it's not worthwhile to approach because I'm just not impressed with it. It doesn't do anything for me. God watches you on that. Esau, he couldn't find repentance from it. God wouldn't allow it. He said, no, you saw the gold. You saw the treasure. You knew my presence was there and you didn't want it. You chose something else. So be careful how you choose. The horrifying results of us rejecting the things of God. Or Esau really didn't see he was rejecting the things of God. He just didn't count of any value. Verse 18. There's two ways to approach God. Two ways. One is through his son, 
Jesus. The other is without Jesus. Man had an encounter with God once without Jesus. He says, for you've not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. You've not come to a blazing fire and that blazing fire falling out of the sky, melting rocks. You've not come to darkness and gloom. You've not come to a giant whirlwind and to a blast of trumpet and sounds of words which sounds with such of those who heard begged that no further words be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountains, it would be stoned. Can you imagine that? You're standing before the holy mountain of God, and you're such a rebel that he tells you, look, if one of your sheep come and touches the mountain up here, he's going to be cooked, so keep him away. And they put their hands, I can't stand that command. How ridiculous. You're going to kill my livestock? They couldn't stand his directives. They couldn't stand his instructions. They put their hands over their ears and he's blowing trumpets and the mountain is shaking. The earth is rattling. There's hailstones falling out of the sky. There's rocks being melted. The voice of God is speaking and man says, I don't want to hear it. If you're without Jesus, you don't want to hear it. And if you're without Jesus and you don't want to follow his way, this is who God looks to you. And if you try to approach to him, fire will touch you. If you try to get close to him, his trumpets are going to say, you're not doing it my way. And all was so terrible. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and I am trembling. No, we have much easier access. If we get between those red flags, that race of faith, he says, here's what we've come to. You've come to Mount Zion. I don't know if you know this or not. Mount Everest has several ways that you can climb it and several ways you can't. <laughs> It's got ways that you can go up on gentle slopes and it's got ways that you can fall off of real quick. It's got ways that you can climb up and nothing will fall on you. And it's got ways that everything will fall on you if you try to climb it that way. If we come through Jesus, we're coming to the city. We're coming to Mount Zion, a mountain of God that we have invitation. Invitation through Jesus. And not only that, invitation to the city, which the city means that there's a road to it. An established path to it. A city of a living God through Jesus. If we learn how to stay in faith in between the red flags. Not only that, he says that here's what you're coming to. If you want to be a man of faith, here's what the other men came of faith. They came to the city of living God. They became aware of God. They're conscious of him. They came to a heavenly Jerusalem and myriads of angels. Do you want those experiences? Because that's what men had in the old time, was it not? That's what the New Testament had. In the new time, they were having encounters with angels and encounters with Jesus on a consistent basis. Read your New Testament. Even after Jesus' resurrection, they're still having encounters with Jesus. And then he makes this statement. He says, this is what you're coming to. If you're a person of faith, you're coming to a general assembly. The church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven to God. That church of the firstborn, it's men of faith who can stand in God's presence and raise their hand in worship till the mighty God becomes visible in our midst even to the unbeliever. It is the church of the firstborn. It's the church of Jesus. When we come together, we're supposed to be looking and thinking, oh my God, we, we're going to have a general assembly to the firstborn and we're enrolled in heaven. Enrolled means the door's open, the school is open and... Heavenly things can begin to take place. Not only that, but it makes the statement, you've come to the judge of all. Is there things that you need judged within yourself of whether they're a God or not? In Jesus, your father can look at you and say, this is not my son, don't do this anymore. He said, you come to the judge of all? Are there circumstances that you don't understand? He might look at you and say, you don't need to understand the circumstances. Look at me. Keep your eyes upon me. Why are you lost in the circumstances? Keep your eyes on me. He said, you come to the spirit of righteousness made perfect. That 
word spirits, that's because it's incorporated of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Those are the only beings of righteousness that there are that can help make us perfect in their eyes because of the visitation of righteousness that comes from them. And he says, and now you've come to, in faith, you get to come to Jesus, mediator of the new covenant. I love that he threw in the mediator. Because, see, there's a lot about the new covenant that he made that I don't understand and I fail in. And so he has to mediate for me. He goes in before the father and says, Lord, he didn't understand that part of the covenant yet. I'm, I'm mediating this for him. I'll teach him. Give me time, father. Remember the, 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 the man that came to the, his uh, vineyard and there was a tree there that didn't produce fruit and he said, cut it down. And the guy said, hey, well, let me dig around it and uh, if it doesn't produce fruit, then I'll cut it down. Jesus is our mediator. He's made a new covenant. We, we entered into that covenant, but this covenant is vast and incorporates all the law of the universe and all the law of God and I don't know all that yet. I have a small finite part of that within Scripture and another finite part of that I can learn through the Spirit. But those things I fail in and do not know if I stay between the flags, Jesus is there to help me. Now, don't do that. Now, don't do this. Come over here. Walk in the Spirit with me. Stay with me now. And those things I fail in, He mediates that new covenant before the Father with me and for me. I so appreciate Him keeping His eyes on me and not taking them off. I so appreciate him helping me stay between the flags. Although it looks sometimes much more exciting outside the flags. And if you can't see the flags, you need to start listening to more messages and praying more and reading your Bible more. And he goes on to say, You've come to this mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now, most people, Theologians are kind of confused about that. Many of them think that sprinkled blood is, you know, we're supposed to sprinkle you with water and that's your baptism. No, the sprinkling was the blood was the atoning sacrifice that was sprinkled onto the mercy seat. Jesus sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat every time I open my mouth the wrong way. <clears throat> and his blood, it speaks. His blood is covering you every time you open your mouth the wrong way. <coughs> but he's given us some instructions to come away from some things. If you want to be a man and woman of faith, you need to accept the fact. If you're engaging in these things, you're not a man and woman of faith because you don't trust God. You trust yourself. But you can become a man and woman of faith by stop trusting yourself and start doing it God's way. And watch the change. Watch God move on your behalf. Either you can move on your behalf or he'll be moving on your behalf. I could go on in verse 25, 26, and 27, but I want to summarize in verse 28. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom. Now, there's the whole thing. By faith, we get to enter the kingdom of God. That kingdom of God is where we come into a spiritual mind and we become aware of the spiritual things in this life. Spiritual things that are physical and tangible here. Spiritual things that are from another dimension that cross over into this dimension. The spiritual things of God, which are physical substance. The spiritual things of Jesus, which are physical substance in this realm. The physical things of the spiritual things of the spirit, which become physical things in this realm. That's why the substance of things hoped for is the ev evidence of things. We're supposed to receive and see the evidence out of what we hope for in that spiritual world. But you can't hope for those things unless you're between the guardrails, the red flags in faith. Living a life, moving a life, moving ahead in Jesus, trusting him and being faithful to him. But if we're going to do that, he makes this statement. Let us show gratitude. True thankfulness. When you stand before the Lord and you understand you're an armadillo and he adopted you. I wasn't a child of Abraham. I had no promises that I could inherit through Abraham. There was only one covenant. It was through, the, through Abraham. It was an Abrahamic covenant. 
I was not. I was born an armadillo here on earth. And he says, hey, I'm going to start me a pet farm. <laughs> I'm going to start with the hardest little critter there is, the armadillo. The one that causes leprosy and looks like hell itself. It got shields and balls up and, and doesn't care about anything but itself. I'm going to deal with that lowly creature. That was us, you and I, who had no covenant with the living God. And he says, because we not only accept Jesus by faith, but that we become men living in faith, that we get engrafted into that covenant of Abraham. Abraham was obedient. Abraham was faithful to God. Therefore, he was a man of faith. If you're not faithful to God, you're not a man or a woman of faith. God is offering to us an understanding of this shield of faith. And these are component parts. Our actions, our deeds, our attitudes, our purposes in this life are all microcosmic portions in this making of this shield of faith that will protect us from the enemy. He offers this to you, to me. Part of that is to stretch our belief system from you exist, you exist in the sky, you exist here. From you're just a spirit to know you're a real person and you're really here. These are different levels of beliefs and trust because if our God is here, we must get to the point that we can speak to him. Prayer, when he says pray continually, it's, it's supposed to be an exchange of God speaking and us listening. Because if we can listen and if we can hear, now new faith is discharged to us, but it must come from the lips of our great God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing when God speaks to you personally through the rhema, through his spirit. If you want more faith, if you want to activate the shield of faith, there are some do's and there are some don'ts contained within this. In our next session, we're going to be getting into the quantum mechanics and the mathematics of the shield of faith. It'll get a little bit more complex but it will bring a whole lot of understanding to the table of how we put these things together, how we weave them together. And then we're going to have to look at the package that supplies the energy to turn on the shield. There's a whole package that goes with that. But shall we pray? Lord, we humbly come before you. We desire to be men and women of faith not men and women that just give you lip service. Lord, you said all of these things so that you could sum it up that we were to become your servants. Help us to become your servant because that's the sign as to whether we're men and women of faith. Whether we serve ourselves in our own ways or whether we serve you. You went through the whole hall of faith to show us men in service to you and women in service to you. You went through the whole discipline thing and then you come right back and you say that we should be in service to you. That is the sign as to whether we're in faith or not. Help us grasp your heart and your mind concerning these issues. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak deep into our heart these truths in Jesus name Amen 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 I hope you got the blimp view of what faith is about and faithfulness and take a few minutes and let you respond Remember, this is not about something you heard last week or even two hours ago. So what did God speak right now to you at the midst of his instructions? How did he speak to you on a personal level? What did he tell you not to do? And what did he tell you to do? What truth came out of the scripture? 
What torch was set afire in the midst of his mighty word? How did he speak to you? How did you receive his discipline? <clears throat> Ball's in your court. I'm going to take a couple minutes. Mark is ready with the microphone. I just saw it was, uh, it was pretty clear that that I've been really up against the edges of the flags on the race. And, and I see that I, I so desperately need need more of the faith that the Lord has deposited for me. I, I can't even count all the different things that he, he spoke to me about of what to do, what not to do. But I think I'll be able to walk away remembering for sure that the need for really listening to more messages and more time in prayer more time in the word he's been so faithful to provide the time and the resources I'm not going to have very many excuses when I stand before him <laughs> amen amen anyone else Gail um, I was just what you said that there's two ways to approach Jesus and, or to, pro, to approach the Lord and, and one is with Jesus and one is without him and um, <clears throat> I was just thinking how often um, maybe I'm not going to put this right but sometimes I, do, I approach him without him you know, I just I just think I should be there, so I just muster up myself to get there, and and I don't really think it's profitable for me. And um, anyway, I just really uh, want to pay attention to that, and because um, I want to be in His presence. <clears throat> it's amazing. He blows the trumpets. There's one set of trumpets that is saying, come to me if we're on that road of faith. There's another set of trumpets that are blown if we're not on the road of faith as a warning. I like it that he blows the trumpets to say, come, because he sets those times. He does. And if we're faithful to come, he's faithful to lead us right between those flags into his presence. It's not a trumpet of warning. Those are different kinds of trumpets. They have different sound altogether that are fearful. But the trumpets of invitation, we receive those when we're locked eye to eye with Jesus. We'll hear those, and they're delightful. Yes, Diane. <clears throat> I heard what Gail said when she said she musters up herself to be in his presence without him. How many times have I been there? Um, but one of the things you said tonight really struck me, and that was when you talked about him waking you up in the night and, and going to prayer and being in his presence. Um, there was such a revelation that hit me the day before yesterday. I was driving home from the store. And I just said, God, if it's not born out of your spirit in me, it's worthless. And it's futile. If it's, if it's not given to me by the spirit of God in me, then there's nothing fruitful, any good fruit that's ever going to come out of it. So I saw that the real value of spending time with him in prayer of being before him, of, a, of pouring our hearts out to him, but of also of worship of him in our private closet. I, I've never seen it, and I've never exper <clears throat> experienced it in the way I am now. And I think it's because I've never really seen those flags that we're supposed to run between. 
But boy, tonight, chapter 12 really came alive to me of what it really is. It is all related to faith, all of it. How I thank God that we live in the day that we do, where his grace and his Holy Spirit is here. I often have thought about Barak. He's one of my favorite people. (laughs) Praise God. Anyone else? Last call. Heidi. I was just really convicted tonight of those times when the Lord has sought to bring me into his presence and I put him off till later and it made me really sad that God, you know, I had that opportunity, like you said, you know, where he wakes you up in the middle of the night and sometimes I've just plain chosen to sleep. So, um, I, and I don't want to do that. Amen. May God bless you in your endeavor to cease. Anyone else? <laughs> last call, last call. Sherry? I appreciated what you said about the kingdom and that being the spiritual mind. I'd never seen it like that, but I knew the kingdom life now was when we live and walk in the spirit. And it's not something we can see necessarily externally, but anyway, I don't know how to say exactly what's going on, but I know that in my being, there has been such a shaken, shaking going on that I know there are things being pulled down, strongholds, and I'm very thankful. And I appreciate what he says here that we receive a kingdom that can't be shaken. So, um, and then it says over here that, you know, um, and his voice shook the earth then, but now how he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So, you know, I I just have to say I have such a sense of his presence and the fear of the Lord. And I'm so thankful because I don't I don't want to veer off and I don't want to take my eyes off him because I know it's between those flags. I know it, Lord, and I'm so thankful, Lord, because I I'm so thankful he has shown this to me and that this is the walk of faith this is the truth i believe that with all my heart and we have to keep our eyes fixed not on the circumstances (laughs) (laughs) amen good word (laughs) anyone else last call last call shall we pray lord we thank you for your word Anything that's not of you in our lives, Lord, we ask you to shake. Shake until it falls or until we fall on our knees before you. Shake it until we can't be shaken. Shake it until we're a part of your kingdom only. Anything that we think is a part of you that's not, shake it. Anything that belongs to this earth, shake it. Until we finally grasp you and you alone. We give you that invitation because we know it just be for our good and it just place us deeper in the throne room. You've got all the provisions we need. We need none that are in ourselves. We praise you and thank you for your mighty word. Now implement it in our lives and show us how to implement it and become obedient to it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Is there another word? Yeah. Okay. Got a microphone, please. Mark's got it. <coughs> Terry said, It seems to me that God is training me to be mindful of him and his viewpoint on the things surrounding me moment by moment. The more I am moment by moment aware of him, the more faith I have. Amen. Amen. Good word, Terry. Are you getting dizzy? I am. (laughs) We love you, Terry. 
Thank you for joining us tonight, you and Elton and Bob and Marilee and the rest of you out there that couldn't make it because of the snow and everything. We just love you to pieces and may God richly bless you. Uh, Butch and Brenda and Pam and Craig, Chester and Terrell, y'all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and family gathering. God bless. Bye-bye. Well, if y'all could help put up the fort before we go, that would be much appreciated.